without further ado, I'd like to welcome our panelists to the stage, please. So uh, we have United States Attorney uh, Ben Wagner. I just call him Ben. I'm sure that those of you who know him call him Ben as well. Uh, and he will serve as our moderator. Uh, making his way onto the stage right now is uh, Mr. Shabir Khan, who is the treasurer and tax collector for San Joaquin County. Next to him, Narab Desai, an assistant United States attorney uh, with our office. And uh, down there on the end, uh, Naeem Ali, uh, Ali, I'm sorry, <laughs> who is a uh, deputy sheriff with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office. Gentlemen. We have three uh, gentlemen here who have different careers. They are all in public service, um, different backgrounds, different ages, um, and different jobs, and talk a little bit about um, kind of how they got there in public service and, and what they did. So um, careers in public service. Uh, so unlike the case in some, um, in some countries in the world, where you have to sort of, it seems like you have to decide your career when you're like 10 years old or something, uh, and, uh, and there's not so much flexibility. Um, generally, in this country, there's a lot of flexibility, and you don't have to um, make those decisions so early. And uh, especially in the law, um, there are a lot of people who come to law school as a second career, um, who come sometimes in uh, you know, in the 30s or 40s or 50s. And when I was in law school, I went to um, NYU School of Law uh, in New York, because I'm from New York originally. And um, when I grew up, I had no lawyers in my family. I knew nothing about law. My, I came from a family of bankers, so the one thing I knew is I did not want to be a banker. Um, but otherwise, I knew very little about law. And um, for me, I was a history major. I liked reading, I liked writing, I liked the social issues. Uh, I was very interested in civil rights issues, and I thought um, going to law school, first of all, was a, a great way to keep this whole student gig going, because that was a lot of fun, um, instead of getting a real job, and it was three years, so I thought I could like stretch this out for a while. Um, and it was very, to me, it was very interesting, a lot of dis uh, the discussions about social issues. I was very interested in civil rights, and uh, I thought that coming out of law school that I was going to be a crusading civil rights attorney um, and work for um, uh, maybe Morris Dees, who's a famous kind of civil rights attorney in the South. Um, and I was very inspired by that, and partly because I knew nothing else about the law. I just knew about some of these great civil rights leaders and so forth. Um, and I had been a little bit involved in local political campaigns in New York, and some of the people who were, I thought were the smartest, most interesting people that I met were lawyers, and I didn't know anything about what they did, but that was interesting to me. So I went to law school, again, no concept of law enforcement, didn't know what a US attorney was, had no interest in that at all. Um, and I spent my first summer working for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York uh, on civil rights matters, and I found that very interesting. Um, my second summer, um, I went to work for a large law firm in New York because all of my classmates were doing it. They would actually pay you for summer work and pay you pretty well. That was impressive to me because um, I'd never had a real job before aside from my newspaper route. Um, and so I went my second summer and worked for a law firm in New York. Uh, and then I went back there after law school and worked there for five and a half years. And it was very, very interesting work. I was surprised at how interesting it was. It was a large New York law firm. This was in 1986, 87, I was there until 92, um, working on different types of things. They represented mostly large companies, sometimes in litigation, um, sometimes not litigation. There's a lot of what lawyers do, which is not the sort of courtroom stuff that you see on TV. So uh, they had a whole branch of the firm that worked on uh, giving adv uh, legal advice to companies, mostly corporations that were raising money, that were doing corporate finance work. Um, and a lot of these banks were underwriting large, you know, these multi-million dollar bond issues and things, and there's a lot of uh, uh, law compliance that you have to do with all of the documents and deciding, you know, which, uh, how to do it. And I found that pretty interesting. So I did all of those things for a while, and it wasn't until I was there four or five years um, that we, that I started to think about doing something else. My wife uh, is from California, which is how I got from New York to California, because I married a California girl, and so that, that was the end of that. No more choice about that. So, um, so here I am in California. Yeah, I, I see some of you have probably had that same experience. So here I am in California. Um, uh, and, but when we were deciding to move to California, and it was an opportunity for us to look at new careers and do something different, because the firm I had did not have an office on the West Coast, um, I started talking to some of my friends, <clears throat> and some of my friends from law school and college 
had gone to a U.S. attorney's office in, in the East Coast and in, uh, in New Jersey, in Connecticut, in New York, <clears throat> and I would talk to them about what they were doing. And by then, I, ha I was developing some interest in trial work. I was working in litigation more, so I had more of an interest um, in trials and, and how that worked in courtroom procedure, <clears throat> and that was very interesting to me. So I was talking to some of them on the phone, and they were describing what they did all day, and I was comparing it to what I did all day. And I was like, man, I want that job, because it was a lot more interesting than my job. Um, <clears throat> and they uh, were telling me about you know, prosecuting bank robbers, for example, or you know, gun crimes, and uh, working with the FBI and with uh, DEA and all these law enforcement agencies, and going to court every day, and getting search warrants, and, and conducting investigations with the agents, and uh, you know, arguing appeals in the courts of appeals, and it was just, it was much more exciting. They had a lot of, they had a lot of opportunities, a lot of responsibilities, and it was kind of exciting. So that's how I um, decided to uh, move over to U.S. Attorney's Office when I was coming out here to California. But that was when I was um, 32, uh, is when I first came to a U.S. Attorney's Office. So, uh, so as you can see, uh, and, it's, and it, I've been here ever since, and in the office I've done lots of different types of things, worked on lots of different types of cases, and I became a supervisor, and then in 2009 I became the U.S. Attorney. So <clears throat> um, it's a career which came to law in a very kind of random way. As I said, I didn't know any lawyers growing up, I didn't know anything about U.S. Attorneys, or I didn't know anything about law enforcement. In fact, growing up in New York, um, hanging out on the streets of New York, I was more likely to not be very appreciative of law enforcement, sorry about that, but I kind of felt like cops were going to hassle me, you know, just because that's the way young kids tended to, thanks, tended to think about the cops um, in New York City where, when I grew up there in the 1970s. So, um, so I, I throw that out there just by way of saying even, you know, I've had a very successful in, in a career in law enforcement and in law, and it's one that has been very exciting and rewarding and interesting to me. Every day has been an exciting day. I go to work every day thinking, man, what a great job. I'm so lucky to have this job. Um, but it's something which I knew nothing about growing up. So there are a lot of different ways that people get to the jobs that they have. So with that, let me, let me, um, let me maybe start, let me start with Shabir, actually. Um, uh, and Shabir uh, uh, has a, uh, a job in public service as the treasurer tax collector of San Joaquin County, um, and which is something I don't know very much about. Um, and what I will ask each of the panelists to do, um, uh, sort of as I have done, to talk for a few minutes about what their current job is and how, you know, how their path was that took them to that job. And then when we get to them, then I'd like to, we'll take some questions and ask people um, a little bit more about that. Shabir. I'm the treasurer tax collector of San Joaquin County. In San Joaquin County, treasurer tax collector is elected. Uh, uh, and it has a four years term. And I've been the treasurer tax collector for 15 years now. Uh, I've been working with San Joaquin County for 36 years. 16 almost as elected and 20 as an employee. I immigrated to this country in 1977, December of 1977. I come from a family where I have professionals. My brothers were uh, much smarter than me. They went to medical school and uh, engineering. Uh, I have accounting background. Accounting back in the old country is considered to be like those who cannot qualify going to medical schools and engineering, they go to, they go to business school. I did that. Um, my interest from day one, you know, when I moved into Stockton, and believe it or not, back then, uh, people were saying, and they probably still say that, why Stockton? You know, why, why you came to Stockton? My reason for coming to Stockton was because my brother sponsored me and he was living in Stockton, so that's why I came. So in the beginning, I had uh, interest in, in public service. Uh, and I was told at that time by my community and some of other people that, oh, immigrants, government job, no way. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get it. So I said, well, I'm, I'll keep trying. <laughs> so, so I did, and I started working for a nonprofit organization. I got a job as an accountant with non nonprofit organization. I worked there for two years. And in 1980, 
uh, I took a test with uh, San Joaquin County, the civil service exam, and then believe it or not, I did pretty well. So I was hired as an accountant by a department that is the auditor controller. And the auditor controller is also an elected position in San Joaquin County. So when I started working for the auditor controller, I had an eye on running for an elected office. So I started working towards that more uh, for, to run for, for, an, for an office. I truly have enjoyed working with, uh, in, in public service because uh, to me it's, it's rewarding when you meet with the people and believe it or not, a lot of people do not have the knowledge of the law. You know, when I, when I ask my staff what's the rewarding thing, including myself, when a taxpayer comes in and leaves our office and knowing when we explain them the law, knowing satisfactorily that they understand the law and then we, we, we think that's the rewarding thing, uh, still it is. So, so 1980 I started and then in 2001 uh, I ran for the office right after 9-11 right after 9-11, and I'm gonna tell you a story if it's not taking too long, it's gonna be a short one. Uh, my consultant at that time uh, told me to hide my identity going out in public because of 9-11. And I said, okay, I will do that. Well, how can I do that with my heavy accent, my look and everything, but that was his advice. So uh, there was a candidate's night where all the candidates were invited, including congressional candidate, the, the, the state, and, and I was invited as a candidate too. So when I walked into, I was at a, a, a fundraising event at my friend's house uh, before that. So when I came late into that uh, event, and when I walked in and they asked me for it, because there was a dinner in, included in that, and I said, no, I, I, I don't feel like eating. And say, oh, lucky you, you'll be the first speaker. So, so when I was walking towards the podium, and I thought about it in a split second, and I guess God helped me in that, if you say it that way, or I can say that I was honest. So when I walked up to the podium and I said, no, I'm not gonna hide my identity. I started by saying, that I was born and raised in Pakistan. And my consultant was sitting in the audience and he shook his head, he said, he's done. <laughs> and then I went on why I'm a qualified candidate. Went on the qualification and everything. When we were done with that, believe it or not, I got the most attention of all in that. Those people came to me and they say, you know, Tell us what we can do for you. We'll vote for you, we'll work for you, because one lady said, you are the honest man. So that's what we need the treasure, to be the honest person. So then I told Steve Reed, I said, you know, and he said, well, it worked, it worked, <laughs> and, it, and it did. And my opponent, after two weeks, then he called me and he says, I don't know how he, you know, he walked the precinct or whatever he's done, he found out, then he called me and he says, you know, I'm withdrawing my name. <laughs> so then I became an unopposed. So ever since that I am um, been uh, elected and the, the other secret about uh, government jobs that I'm gonna tell you is that uh, back when I started, I think that probably was true the public service, uh, pu public sector was not paying as much as private sector was. And here's the secret. Now, at least in San Joaquin County, I can tell you, pays more than private sector. And, and plus the benefits that you, retirement and other benefits that you get. It's been 36 years and I still enjoy it and like Mr. Wagner is saying that he likes to go to the office, I do the same. I love it. 
I, I uh, you know, one taxpayer happy out of my office makes my day. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Narav Desai. I'm an assistant United States attorney uh, here in Sacramento. I work in Ben's office. Ben's my boss, uh, so I've got to be careful today. Um, but uh, I've, I've been in the office for about three and a half years, coming up on four years now. Um, and, and unfortunately, my, fortunately or unfortunately, my story to how I got to this job is just as complicated as Ben's. So um, there's a bit of history to it. But before I get to that, um, what I do in the office is I work in the criminal division. Um, I'm one of what we call a line prosecutor uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and um, I handle a lot of different types of cases, but uh, um, I work predominantly on white-collar cases, so these are like fraud cases, embezzlement, tax cases, things like that, as well as um, on human trafficking cases, uh, predominantly involving um, folks who are forced into, into labor, compelled to work by their employer or by another individual or by a homeowner. Um, and uh, we, we try to identify those cases in the community and prosecute those federally. And in connection with that, I do a lot of outreach to various service providers and um, other groups on how to identify human trafficking victims and reporting that to law enforcement. Um, and so, like Ben, I love my job. It's a great job to go to every day. Um, it's exciting. Um, there's always something new every day. There's always something I don't know how to do that comes up every day, which requires me to go find out how to do it, which is an exciting part of the job. Um, and uh, it's, it's really enjoyable to be able to, to try to help the public or feel like your work means something every day and that you're doing something um, that might help your community. And you always feel like, in this job, I always feel like I'm doing the right thing and I'm expected to do the right thing expected to do the thing that is just and that is fair and that's a really important thing for me personally in the work that I do in this job and having Ben as my boss um, and, and his view of how this job should work um, allows me to always keep that pretty simple, straight and narrow and honest and, and, um, and uh, meaningful uh, mission in sight. So step, stepping back, the way I got to this position, I didn't come to the U.S. Attorney's Office until I'd already been practicing law for about eight or nine years. Um, my, uh, my story, it's, uh, I'll, I'll touch, about, touch on some things that have been mentioned already this morning, but my, my folks um, emigrated to the United States from India back in the early 1970s, um, and they were fortunate to have um, professional backgrounds. They didn't come to the States with a lot of material possessions, but they did have their education. So education was really quite important in our family growing up. Um, and uh, it, this might be a familiar story, but um, there was basically kind of two or three professions that were seen as maybe the way that you'd, you would carve out your, your, your niche in life, and, and that would be maybe medicine or um, business or teaching mathematics or something like that. Um, and so I always thought myself to be on that, saw myself to be on that track. And um, I was also fortunate though that my parents were pretty open-minded about um, career paths. Uh, so. Um, worked really hard growing up, um, and I share some of this for, for some of the younger folks who are in the crowd just to kind of give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, ended up going to college at uh, UC Berkeley for four years. Um, I majored in history as well. Um, my father was a lover of history, and, and I picked that up from him and really enjoyed reading about history. And um, I also took all the science classes that I would need to go to med school, although I never ended up using those things. Um, but uh, I really liked language, and I um, took several undergraduate law courses when I was in, in school that focused on um, what's called jurisprudence, which is essentially like legal philosophy and entertainment law and international law and things like that. Um, and I really fell in love with the idea of using language to advocate for a position and really rhetoric. Um, and so I ended up uh, taking a job after, law, after undergraduate um, school in a law firm for about a year just to figure out if this is something I could do. Um, and I figured out that it was. And so I applied to law school um, and got a nice scholarship to come back here uh, to Sacramento at McGeorge School of Law here in town and um, went to law school there. And I never wanted to actually be, I never actually wanted to work in government. I never thought that as, that, saw that as a goal of mine. Um, I had no other lawyers in my family. I didn't exactly know which, how to get to a certain job or what were the best jobs or what were the most exciting jobs. And so I figured I'll just aim myself for a job that uh, pays really well and, and uh, you know, in the private sector basically was that kind of job. So, um, you know, a lot of opportunities came up 
during law school to, to work in government. And I worked for some folks in law school who said, oh, you should work for the Centers for Disease Control or the National Security Agency. And I said, I don't know, but I want to work for a law firm because it's going to pay well and be comfortable and secure and that kind of thing. Um, I just didn't know what, I didn't have an exposure to government. I didn't have an exposure to what government lawyers did. And so I, I probably missed a couple of opportunities there, but, um, but, but that's, that's just life. So um, eventually I ended up in the private sector working at um, what you'd probably consider a corporate law firm, like a regional law firm here, about a 130 lawyer law firm here in town working on, um, on basically commercial disputes, disputes, business disputes, basically company X versus company Y fighting over um, a contract or something like that. And I found that to be, um, you know, it was interesting work. Um, it was exciting at times, but similar to what Ben mentioned, um, it wasn't always the most exciting or fulfilling work. And I really felt a pull towards something that had a little bit more contribution to the public more generally. Um, and I eventually ended up um, having an opportunity to work for um, a couple of federal judges um, so uh, as a research attorney, so judges, federal judges have a staff of lawyers who, um, who work for them and, and do research and write memos and inform the judge about various aspects of the law relative to a case they might be hearing. And so it's a kind of behind the scenes job, it's public service uh, oriented type of job, um, and it's a really quite a lot of fun. You do a lot of reading, a lot of writing. Um, you feel like you're part of the process of helping adjudicate disputes between um, various parties. Um, and that was really quite, quite fun as well, but I still felt myself being pulled towards something that had a little bit more impact and a little bit more meaning broadly, and um, uh, a, series, a number of jobs at the U.S. Attorney's Office came up, um, and I applied for all of them. I think it was 14 positions I applied for. I really wanted to do this job because I'd always heard about, by this time in my career, I'd learned that assistant United States attorneys, that was a really uh, desirable job. It was an exciting job. It was also a job where you were expected to do the right thing, and you were always expected to be forthcoming and honest and have integrity, and the court really viewed um, assistant U.S. attorneys as, uh, we call it wearing the white hat, and there was an expectation that you're gonna do the right thing. And so I thought if I was gonna get back into the courtroom and in a job that would have more impact broadly, it was the U.S. Attorney's Office where I wanted to work. And I was fortunate enough to get a position there um, about, about four years ago. And so, um, that's a long and meandering sort of background, but I hope, um, especially for folks who maybe don't see themselves as having the path to, to government service or to law enforcement, that's kind of my, my sort of um, meandering path to how I got into law enforcement. It's been quite, quite a rewarding job, and um, I feel like every day when I go to work, I get to do the right thing and do something interesting. And uh, that's just a little bit about how I got to where I am. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Naeem Alvi. I'm a deputy sheriff for the Sacramento Sheriff's Department. I've been a deputy for five years now. I started off my career working at the Rio Casemnes Correctional Center. It's a jail in Elk Grove. I did about four years over there. Um, a little over a year ago, I transferred to the courthouse, and I got to work over there in downtown. And within the past five months, I got to be part of a brand new unit called the Community Relations Unit. The mission of our unit is to look both within the Sheriff's Department and the various communities we serve to identify ways to strengthen relationships, enhance trust, increase transparency, to heighten the delivery of our services. I said a bunch of words that you probably don't know what that means. To break down the simplest form, our job is to make sure people like the Sheriff's Department. And how do we do that? It's coming out to events like this, going meeting with religious leaders, business leaders, uh, everyone in the community. We want people to know that they have a voice, and we are not what the media portrays us to be. For the past couple of years, social media has really, really uh, given a negative outlook on law enforcement. Some justified, some not so justified. So we want people to know that what you see in the East, in the South, in the Midwest, wherever you see a, a 10 second snippet of a YouTube clip, doesn't represent all law enforcement. We want people to know that we are here to serve you guys and we are doing the best that we can, but we can always do a little bit better, which is why we need to talk to you guys about how we can improve our jobs too. That's my job right now, but my history behind how I became a deputy sheriff is that I was born in India. Uh, I came to America with my parents and my sister in 1990. I was five years old. Uh, grew up in a one-bedroom apartment living in Fremont. Um, 
you know, my parents pushed for education just like a lot of Muslim communities, a lot of Indian Southeast Asian communities do. My sister was a straight A student. She went to high school and college, finished top of her grade, and she's working in Google. She does a bunch of jobs doing computer science stuff, stuff that I have no idea about. But she raised the bar for education so high, and I was not that person. I would come home from school and go play sports with my friends and not focus in school. My sister would come home, and she would start studying immediately. And she wouldn't stop until she went to sleep. And she'd all over again the next day. Me, I'd come home, go out, play tag, play football, do whatever with my friends, and then do my homework and watch TV. I would get A's, B's, and some C's, but I never lived to my sister's expectations that my parents had for me. And that really hurt me a lot because I thought I did the best that I could, but because my goals were a little bit different in school and in personal life, it hurt me because my parents said, you know, look at your sister. She's doing so good. She's a success story. And look at you. You're getting A's and B's, but you're getting C's. You can do so much better. But I always told them that I'm not my sister. I'm my own self. And I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm happy with what I am. And, you know, it's for them to understand that. So just about law enforcement, I remember when I was about six or seven years old, we came home from shopping. And we lived in an apartment on the first story. I remember my dad opened the door, and our house was empty. And we heard someone running from the backyard. So we literally just missed a burglary in progress. And I remember my parents were freaked out. And uh, I've never seen that before in my parents' eyes. I mean, they've always been strong. They've been, you know, my foundation. And to see them scared and seeing them nervous, it shocked me. I was like, well, you know, you're supposed to solve everything. What's wrong? And, you know, they called the cops, and we waited in the parking lot. And when the cops came, you know, my parents had a sigh of relief. And they're like, you know what? It's going to be OK. You know, the, the cops are here. The good guys are here to take care of us. And that impacted me from an early age. I, the thing that I saw was just by the mere presence of a uniformed personnel. They didn't arrest someone. They walked through the house and said, OK, it's clear. You know, go call insurance or whatever you got to do. But that's all they can do. But just because of their mere presence, it caused my parents to calm down and to relax. And that impacted me. Because there's not that many jobs that you can kind of do that. By just you being there, at some, someone's very worst time, you come in, do your best, and you try to make the situation a little bit better. So in the back of my mind, since I was a little kid, I was like, oh, that's a cool job. You know, that'd be pretty cool to do. But I never really thought I was going to be a cop. My, you know, my parents pushed me to be a doctor, a lawyer, just like what everyone else here is saying. My entire family is all engineers and finance and business, and I, I started off doing computer science in college, and I was looking at equations and math. There was like 3x plus 7y equals 82, and I'm like, there's numbers and there's letters, and it's supposed to equate to this, and I'm like, I don't get it. So I kind of knew at the point. I was like, this is not for me. Like, so I went on a whim and took a criminal justice class. And listening to the laws, the history behind the laws, and my professor that was a former cop telling stories about, oh, you know, things that I did, the exposure that I got to see that no one else can really say or do, it intrigued me. So I started taking more classes in criminal justice, and I kind of came to the realization that this is what I want to do. And I didn't know how to tell my parents because, you know, they were pushing me to be in computers and, you know, the stereotypical Indian job. And when I told my dad, I was like, hey, you know what? I think I want to be a cop. He was like, OK, you know, do what you got to do. I was like, oh, it was that simple. OK, that's cool. And then when I told my mom, I think I crushed her. Because <laughs> she looked at me, and she's like, what would you say? I was like, I want to be a cop. She goes, no, you're not doing that. Straight up said no. And I was like, what do you mean no? I'm not asking for your permission. I'm going to do it. I'm just letting you know what I'm going to do. And she goes, no, you're not going to do that. And I was like, why not? You know, what's, the, what's the problem? And she goes, it's not a respectable job. And I was like, I've lived with you my entire life. I've never heard you say once anything bad about law enforcement. So where is this anger, hostility coming from? And she wouldn't say anything. She's like, no, you're not doing it. You be a cop, you're leaving the family. You know, you're going to be exiled. You're gone. 
So me and her were going back and forth because I'm stubborn. I get that from her. So I said, no, well, I don't care. I'm going to do this. I have to do the job, not you. So I'm still going to pursue this. So there was a lot of threatening going on, like leave the house. And I pack with the bag. She goes, stay home. Don't go anywhere. And I'm like, all right, whatever. And then I started talking about, to my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, my family, friends. And I told them the same thing, like, you know, I want to do this. And they kind of said the same thing, you know, don't do it. It's not a respectable job. And I said, why? You know, what's the reason behind it? And they kind of told me, they were like, well, back in India and where we grew up, the cops are very corrupt. They are very uneducated. They're very untrained. And I was telling them, like, that's not the case over here. I understand what happens over there happens over there, but you can't come to America and assume what happens over there is the same thing that happens over here. But they wouldn't take it. They wouldn't understand it. They're like, no, that's all we know. We are scared of the cops. We don't, we'll smile at them and you know, shake their hands or do whatever, but I don't trust them because that's what they've been exposed to. So this happened for the course of like me three years, me showing people, well, no, the, being a cop in America is completely different. There's tests you have to take. There's a psychology test. There's a background test. You have to go through an academy. You are very well trained and very well prepared, unlike what you might know in India and Pakistan and other Southeast Asian countries. And um, so when I finally started to win them over, my mom threw a curveball at me. And she goes, well, you know, if you're a cop, what parent's going to want to you know, send their daughter off to marry a cop? You know? I was like, I thought it was a scare tactic. I was like, no, that, that can't be the case. Yeah, I don't believe that for a second. And my response was like, if that's what they think, I don't want to marry into a family that thinks like that. So she's like, okay, well, you know, you'll see, you'll see. That's what she said. I'm like, okay. So I paid my way through the academy, and uh, I paid about $5,000 to go through the academy. And uh, I never got the support from anyone in my family all, or my friends. They all said, you know, why are you doing this? You're brown. You should be in computers. You should be in the Bay Area doing Silicon Valley jobs, not be in the police academy and trying to live out this silly dream of yours. So it was really me against the world. And you know, when they realized that I paid five thousand dollars, it blew their mind. They're like, "What are you doing? You know, you paid, you went to college, you paid for that. Now you're paying to do another job. You know, if you got, if you were a business major or you know, finance or whatever, you would have a job by now. But instead, you're paying to do more additional training." I told them, yeah, but it's my passion. It's what I want to do, and I'm still going to do it. And this happened in 2009. If you guys are familiar with 2009, if you guys don't remember, it was a horrible time in the economy where people were losing their jobs back and forth. And I graduated the academy in 2009, and I thought I was going to get a job immediately because I'm bilingual, I'm brown, and I have a college education. I've never been in trouble with the law. So I thought I was the ideal candidate for any law enforcement agency. So I, once I started applying and went through the process of multiple departments and you know, being rejected one after one after one, I thought it was, you know, is it because of the color of my skin? Is it because I'm Muslim? You know, what's the reason that I'm not getting these jobs? And then I kind of just realized, well, you know what? Let me think of it from a business point of view. There's two spots that are open. You have 150 people applying. I have no, no experience as being a cop, just than, other than being in the academy. I'm committing people that have been working for 10 plus years out in patrol, and they got laid off because of the economy, which is not their fault. I don't blame them at all. And it's me and them. And from a business standpoint, who are you going to hire? Are you going to hire someone that knows how to do the job or someone that you're going to take a risk? You're going to go with someone that knows how to do the job. And it took me a while to realize that, but, you know... I kind of realized, okay, well, you know what? I'm not going to give up because the, the naysayers got louder and stronger and they kind of pierced into my soul a bit more because it took me a year and a half to get a job. And I started off thinking, I'm only going to play in the Bay Area. That's where my family's at. So I was like, I'll go back there. It'll be a good way to go there and you know, reconnect with my family. Once I applied all over the Bay Area, no one was hiring me. So I was like, okay, well, I'll try Sacramento. Tried Sacramento, no one was hiring. And I was like, oh my God, you know, what's happening? So I went down to SoCal, started applying Riverside, Oxnard, you know, Beverly Hills, all these departments, and no one was hiring. And I was like, I screwed up, you know, like I messed up big time because I just wasted about two and a half years trying to reach my goal when everyone in my family is saying, you know, you're silly for doing this because you're not going to do it. And I was like, I can't believe they're right. 
I can't believe they were right. And then lo and behold, one day, Sack Sheriff calls me and goes, hey, um, you still interested in our department? You know, we'll start your background right now. And I was like, I'm interested. I don't know if I remember applying with you guys, but I'm down. Let's go. Let's do this. So I got the job. Even when I got the job, people still were like, you're never going to pass probation. You're still not going to be anything in this department. You're going to be a nobody. And I still had the naysayers. And it was weird because I'm like, I'm doing as much as I can to prove people wrong, but they always find something to nitpick on. And uh, the funny thing was, when I became a cop and I passed probation, all that kind of stuff, I was settled and I was ready to do the next step in my life, which is to get married. And obviously, if you guys know, it, you're not supposed to date in Islam and Southeast Asian culture. So the process of getting married is kind of like online dating. You get a picture of a person and a quick bio. And then you go, OK, mom, I like this person. You, know, you talk, talk to her parents about it. And um, mine was my picture, you know, my name, where I grew up. And it's a deputy sheriff. So <laughs> my mom would call people up and goes, hey, you know, my son likes your daughter. Can, can you talk to him? And they go, oh, yeah, you know, what does he do? Well, you know, he, he was born in India. You know, he's Kilbury here. He's a good job. What does he do? Oh, you know, well, um, he's a cop. Click. And it's like, hello? Hello? And it happened over and over and over again. And I was in shock. I was like, really? That's the way it is, huh? And she's like, I told you, people do not respect cops here. And um, it, it took a long time for me to understand that. And, you know, which is why. It's my goal, my mission to come out here and talk to the general public and tell people that um, what you might have these preconceived notions of you know, law enforcement or whatever in other countries, it doesn't have to be that way over here. And it's not that way over here. And I want to get my message out to let people know about you know, what I'm doing, the, the journey that I went through. Because a lot of all my friends that are you know, Southeast Asian people that want to be cops but are scared to pursue it because they know it'll be the same journey as me. And I never had anyone that looked out for me. I didn't know any cops. And no one in my family was in law enforcement. So I was the first one. I'm, I'm the black sheep of my family, pretty much. I still am. So now I have friends saying, oh, well, you know, you're our example. You know, like, they go and tell their parents, like, hey, he's doing it. And, you know, he has a good job, so why can't I do it? So now more and more of my friends are in various stages of applying with a department or in the police academy right now. And it's a great feeling to know that. You know, if my story can help one person, I think it would be a success for me. And, um, you know, that's pretty much my story. Thank you so much.